Uh, I hope you enjoyed the coffee break. And I just want to remind everyone that after this talk, um, we will resume the talks at 2 o'clock after lunch um, with Dr. Chazen. So we look forward to seeing you there as well. Um, today I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Fikret Urkis, who has joined us all the way from the University of Manitoba, Canada, where he is Distinguished Professor Emeritus. Um, he just retired in the fall, so we're glad that he could be here. Uh, Dr. Burgess obtained his PhD in Marine Sciences from McGill University before he transitioned into work in the social sciences. Because of his interdisciplinary research interests, he is at the forefront of research on integrated human environment systems, and he has helped advance research on indigenous and traditional ecological knowledge. His research deals with commons theory, resilience, and traditional ecological knowledge, as well as community-based conservation. And Dr. Burkis has over 200 peer-reviewed publications with over 50,000 Google citations. He has also published 10 books with others in the works, including Coasts for People, Sacred Ecology, Navigating Social Ecological Systems, and Linking Social and Ecological Systems. Internationally, Dr. Burkis has uh, participated in the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. Uh, he's worked with the United Nations Development Program, uh, as well as the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. <coughs> he has also conducted training sessions for young scholars and professionals in a number of international countries, um, contributing to the global advancement of integrated human environment systems thinking. In addition, Dr. Burkis holds awards from the IUCN, the Royal Society of Canada, the International Association, Association for the Study of the Commons, and the Ecological Society of America's Sustainability Science Award for his book, for his book Sacred Ecology. We're so pleased that Dr. Burkus could be with us today, so please join us in welcome, welcoming him. Um, and he will be speaking on sustainability for the Anthropocene, adaptive governance in a multi-level world. Uh, this being an ecology symposium, I should first establish my ecology credentials. Uh, as a graduate student, I actually read some of uh, Eric Bianca's papers, as well as Robert MacArthur and G. E. Hutchinson, which hyper volume and so on. Uh, but then, as uh, Laura mentioned, I transitioned into more of an interdisciplinary kind of creature, expanding my niche, you might say. And, uh, um, and, and here I am. And I'm not going to talk so much about ecology, but, but about what ecologists can, can move on to deal with some of the problems of this new age. And uh, uh, so for the more specialized ecologists, I guess this is a bit of a challenge to sort of expand and, and look at some of these other things that ecologists do. So that's our context. Ecology and um, This is one definition. Like when human activities started to cause significant changes in the Earth's biogeochemical cycles and ecosystems. There are, of course, a number of definitions of this. And uh, what I'd like to bring to you are a number of considerations in the way that I'm thinking of this, and I'll try to explain uh, how we can approach some of these. The, our theme is micro to macro. To me, that's multi-level environmental management. And uh, then I'm going to make a case for interdisciplinary ecology uh, as applied to sustainability. And then I'm going to make the case that we need to address human dimensions and that uh, in my work we do by looking at social ecological systems rather than ecological systems as such. Uh, I will spend some time on resilience because to me that's really the major branch of ecology that deals with change and uncertainty which of course characterizes our current world. And that leads us to governance issues, in particular, adaptive governance as a step beyond adaptive management, which is probably familiar to many of you. 
I'm going to start first with a big picture approach. I've been um, involved in the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, and I think it's still, it's more than 10 years old now, but it still stands as the last big ecological assessment and the expansion of, of ecology into these, these broader global issues. Um, and then, then I proceed on to the idea of coupled social ecological systems, resilient scale, and adaptive governance. I'm going to end up with some comments on collaborative approaches, which I think we need as a way of tackling these issues. OK, so this is part of that, that bigger picture scan. And uh, um, uh, uh, when, this is from Millennium Assessment. It looks uh, here we have the various major ecosystems or, or biomes, and then there is one, two, three, four, five kinds of major change from habitat change that Eric Bianca mentioned as the finish to cause climate change, invasive species, overexploitation, pollution. The, uh, these are the drivers, the color coding gives from low to very high. And the current trends of the driver is decreasing impact, continuing increasing, and rapid increasing. From this, you can see that climate change is, uh, is basically all up arrows, and so is pollution. Some areas are mixed. For example, if you're looking at temperate forest ecosystems, in fact, it's not looking too bad. Uh, if you look at my main interest, this coastal, coastal marine uh, here, uh, you can see that it's very high impact of habitat change and an increasing impact, increasing, rapid increase, 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 rapid increase when you look at pollution. So it's a, it's a, it's a nice way of, of, uh, of you know, basically looking at multiple kinds of systems. Now, one of the things that Millennium Assessment did was that we talked about not so much ecology as such, but rather ecosystem services and classified it into supporting, provisioning, regulating, and cultural. And then it looked at the interaction between ecosystem services and human well-being. Uh, so that's an interesting link that, that if you're an ecology graduate student, you probably wouldn't get to it because you could never publish, you could never really do a thesis on that, it's too big. And it won't give you publishable papers either. But, but that's, that's basically the way that applied ecology has been linking up with, with human systems. Um, I should also add that this classification is now under revision by the new ITDS. And so it will be in, a, in probably about a year's time, there's some publications coming up. Uh, if you spend some time trying to figure these out, it's going to be out of the door. Now this one, actually this is not from the Millennium Assessment, but from Stockholm Resilience Center. It gives a bit of a, a chronology of development of Earth system science, 70s and 80s, and then goes on whole climate acid rain, 80s, 90s, and Anthropocene really comes into discussion in about the year 2000. And then uh, resilience people started talking about planetary boundaries. Uh, so they, uh, they, they looked at some, some major variables and they tried to quantify how far we are before the whole system is endangered. And uh, that has some interesting results which I won't get into. Uh, 2015 Sustainable Development Goals, so this is linking more ecology with human science, and then the Paris Climate Agreement. And, and this current report that I'm quoting from is looking at global commons in the Anthropocene, and of course commons is my area, or one of my major areas. Now, so here's my starting point with my analysis, and that's the idea of social ecological systems as the unit of analysis. 
so as somebody who works with fishing communities and coastal fisheries, I don't look at just the, the fish in the fishery, but the interaction between the fisheries, the fish, but also the, the markets and the regulatory environment that impact the whole relationship. If you simply look at the fish, you're missing all the other links. Or if you simply look at the fishing community, you're missing, again, all the other links. So you have to look at these as a whole. Uh, we started working on this. Uh, this is uh, the book with Carl Falk in Sweden, Linking Social Ecological Systems, came out in 98. We followed up with a book in 2003 uh, with examples of how to use this kind of idea. Um, it does look at ecosystems as a nested set like a small watershed inside a bigger watershed inside a bigger watershed, but also the social systems as a nested set with communities and regional areas and national and international global. So to us, these are couple interdependent and co-evolutionary systems. The fishermen's activities actually co-evolved with what what they are trying to do in their fishery. Uh, less formal, it's a pictorial representation, it's from Japan. It's the Japanese concept of sato umi, a mosaic of coastal ecosystems where people interact with the environment. And it's, it's, it's applied, it's, uh, it's used actually, this whole idea is used in in rebuilding the coastal area after that, that, that horrendous earthquake and tsunami in 2011 with Fukushima reactor and all that. You may remember seeing this wall of water just sweeping across the coastal area, not just a few miles, it, it swept inland quite a bit. And uh, so the Japanese are doing their restoration by, by, by looking at this sort of multiple use, people and environment together kind of system. The micro to macro, of course, is a scale issue, right? And uh, the geographers are fond of saying scale matters. It really does. And if we're going to do ecology, and look at Anthropocene, we have to look at ecology from the ground up. We have to look at the, the, the small piece of ecology that a lot of ecologists do. We have to look at the modeling that ecologists do. We have to look at the regional studies, ecosystem level studies. The journal ecosystem only started not that long ago, less, less than 20 years ago. Uh, because ecologists were looking narrower and narrower, as, as Eric Pianca pointed out. And uh, if you look through the straw and hit the finer and finer points, you, start, you, you, you do really miss the big picture after a while, right? So, uh, uh, so a number of senior ecologists went to Steve Carpenter and they said, we want this new ecology journal called Ecosystems because otherwise we're going to be losing ecology of ecosystems, everybody becoming so reductionistic, and that's how that journal started. So that's, that's the, uh, the, the idea of, uh, of the scale. We have to look at the full scale, and then we have to see what's happening in these ecosystems. Um, Brian Walker and colleagues define resilience as the capacity of the system to absorb disturbance and reorganize while undergoing change. So it's a dynamic concept. Resilience is not just staying as is, but resilience is absorbing that disturbance um, and reorganizing while that change occurs. But what's the important thing? Uh, the important thing is essentially being able to maintain the same ecosystem function, structure, identity, and feedbacks. And if those, those variables change, then you have a different system. So a resilient social ecological system uh, has the ability to respond to shocks and stresses, like the shocks and stresses that we're imposing on all the ecosystems that all of you have been studying. 
Um, so resilient systems can absorb shocks and stresses, self-organize, learn, and adapt. So this really goes beyond ecology, right? Um, self-organize, yes, part of ecology, but learning and adapting is actually going outside of ecology, and yet it's an essential characteristic, essential feature of resilient systems. Um, what's involved in resilience? Um, the, the current trend, this is the work of uh, Christoph Bene, uh, French scholar who works more mainly in the UK, but is now in South America, and Katrina Brown in the UK. Uh, and this is mostly coming out of the, the uh, development literature. And resilience is seen as, as a sum of three things. This absorptive coping capacity, adaptive capacity, and transformative capacity. Um, Buzz Holling, who uh, is behind much of resilience thinking, basically sees resilience here. Um, but these scholars are saying, well, coping is also part of resilience. And that's, that's the attempt to remain persistent. Because that's really the first step when you have change. You try to stay in the same, same area. You want to stay, you want to be persistent in your social ecological system. But if that becomes impossible, then, then you go for incremental adjustments in the system, and that's the adaptive part. Um, and if that fails, then, then you're talking about transforming the system. Um, my colleague Carl Folke and the Stockholm Resilience Center are now looking at global transformations. That's, that was the report I cited. Uh, I, uh, of course, we all deal with multi-level, but I prefer my, my area is the local level at the community level that, that, uh, that Lauren was talking about. So the basic resilience literature, the, the book Anarchy, is the classic one. Probably the, the most complete one is by Perry Chapin and colleagues, uh, Perry at the University of Alaska. It says principles of ecosystem stewardship, but it's really about resilience. Um, it's a systems concept, and it deals with nested levels. Uh, this 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 micro to macro. Uh, the important point is it deals with uncertainty because uncertainty is an essential unpredictability of complex systems. In other words. Resilience people don't say, well, we need more studies so we can get the answer. Resilience people are saying, systems have essential unpredictability, irreducible unpredictability. No matter how much data you have, you still have unpredictability. So it's an important concept because it's getting worse and worse, okay, in, in our Anthropocene. And then, of course, they deal with drivers. Um, including direct drivers, but also indirect, like globalization effects. One important idea in, in resilience ecology is the notion of regime shifts. These are surprising, large, and often persistent changes in the function and structure of ecosystems. And they're really important because they're difficult to deal with, they challenge governments, because they're difficult to predict, and they're difficult to reverse. And they alter, of course, not only biodiversity and what happens uh, among the interaction of animals and plants, but, but also uh, ecosystem services. And uh, I'll, I'll show you more from Roshan's paper, but in, in pictorially, this is what the system looks like. Um, in resilience thinking. This is a sort of a ball and socket analogy. Um, a stable resilient system is, is like, a, like a ball in a, in a fairly deep socket. It moves around. 
but it retains a system identity because it stays in the cup. In an unstable system, this fall can be displaced and beyond a certain threshold, it falls into a different cup, a different stability regime. And environmental and, and other kinds of changes uh, become really important because then they challenge the resilience of the system. So the original system has a high resilience and changes tend to push the ball up. Uh, or another way of saying it is that the, the cup becomes shallower so it becomes more likely to, for the ball to fall into a different, um, different system state. Now, this is probably pretty abstract, so it's interesting to see that actually people have been using these ideas in actual ecosystems. So on this uh, side, you have the actual ecosystems like the thermal haline circulation of the ocean, which is ocean-wide, and therefore it's all international. But when you go into something like um, soil salinization, you do have a, a local component, as well as a regional component, and an international component. And this also goes from, for things like forest to savanna. Uh, you, you can burn a savanna and you get a different system. And, uh, uh, and it, it again has these components. So here, here you see, uh, this is probably, well, this is sort of quantified. This is for out of that paper from uh, plus one, 2015, and, uh, and, and you can see that actually the, uh, to what extent these drivers are, are playing out in the real world from the micro to macro. And, and people are, are actually using these ideas as a way of saying, what level do we manage mangroves? What level do we manage uh, coral reefs? So, social ecological resilience is all about scale. You can show it as a, uh, and all the way from, oops, all the way from individuals and households. And I have a Brazilian PhD student who's looking at the interaction between this level and this level. But you can also look at it as the Stockholm Resilience Center does with global uh, as the main focus and then look at the various other levels. Um, Resilience people tend to look at it in terms of these, these, um, um, these um, resilience cycles, uh, and they see the cycles as embedded in one another, from the smallest, which is small and fast, to the large and slow. Uh, for example, the large and slow could be a whole forest, the medium one could be a stand, and the small and fast could be a tree within that forest. So what happens at one level, in fact, can influence the other level. Um, and it can be from bottom up, well, as well as top down. There are many, many examples from different kinds of systems. There, there is a very good website called Resilience Alliance, and, and you can see literally hundreds of examples of, of different levels and how they interact with one another. Now, the important point here is that we live in a multi-level world. Uh, so things are happening just around College Station and Texas as a whole, and then USA as a whole, global as a whole, and they're, they're interrelated no matter what people say. Um, And, the, and the, the related point is that with this high uncertainty and low predictability, there is low controllability. In other words, many of these systems don't lend themselves into the kind of science which requires being able to control your variables. So, the, so adaptive management has come up as a, as a, as a way to deal with that. Uh, 
So that's why you can talk about learning and adapting and manage by learning by doing. In other words, a lot of environmental management, which is what I do, has to do with, with, with that kind of experimentation which doesn't work, but you learn from the mistakes. So one way to look at it, this is from the work of uh, Gary Peterson, uh, who's now in the Stockholm Resilience Center. Um, he, he makes the point that if you, if you graph controllability and uncertainty, conventional science, conventional environmental management works best when you have high certainty or low uncertainty and when you have a controllable system. As you move away out of this, then, then you're in a territory which, which really cannot be handled by the conventional science, conventional environmental management. So then you go into adaptive management. So adaptive management, learning by doing, is not a new idea. Uh, in ecology, it goes back to Buzz Holmes, 2000, no, uh, 1978 book uh, called Adaptive Management. But in fact, it has been in use by city planners for longer than that. The, the basic idea is the planning cycle, where you conceptualize the problem, you plan the action and the monitoring, you implement the action, and then you look at what happens. You look to analyze, use, and adapt. And then you, you learn from what you found out. And then you go into a new cycle. Um, in Canada, national parks use a 10-year planning cycle. But I'm pretty sure, I, although I'm not quite sure about uh, US parks, I'm, I'd be very surprised if they also didn't have something similar. So this is actually a very really common kind of management tool. And the point is there's no end point. Uh, you do the cycle, whether it's a five-year cycle or a 10-year cycle, and you learn from it and you move on. And the idea being, if it's a national park, uh, the visitor numbers will be changing, the wildlife composition will be changing, the vegetation composition will be changing. In fact, it will be futile to manage the park, to try to manage the park in exactly the same state, because it's going to be different. So, so the planning cycle, this adaptive management, gives you the tools to deal with that. Now, adaptive governance goes beyond management. Um, because a lot of management is based on assumptions of equilibrium and comparability. The uh, classic paper is, oops, Holling and Matt, in Conservation Biology 96, um, and, adapt, and, and conventional management deals with one sector at a time, which of course is also a problem, right? Because you can't do a coastal park separately from coastal habitat management. So there's feedback learning involved as a way of dealing with uncertainty, and that brings you into an interdisciplinarity and into more comprehensive kind of management that is adapted and covered. Amazing, that when we stuck at that pass of it. Okay, so I, I just go back and make it. Uh, I, I, I wrote a paper in Fish and Fisheries in 2012, and I, I said um, ecosystem management, evolution or revolution. Um, I, I think it's a revolution because it requires uh, multi-sector management. It requires feedback learning, taking uncertainty into account, and it has to be interdisciplinary. Um, because you can't just deal with plankton, you can't just deal with coastal vegetation. You have to deal with all those things together, along with the human dimensions. Uh, and then people, you know, throw up their hands and say, "Well, then how can we manage it? You know, we have enough problems just managing the ecology." Well, 
the point is you're not really managing the ecology anyway. You really can't do very much if you just try to manage the ecology. So that's moving us into adaptive governance. Now, the idea of governance has been evolving. Um, it's, a, it's an old English term, but it had fallen out of use over the decades, but then it got picked up about, about well, more or less 20 years ago. Um, as used currently, governance is considered the broader arena in which institutions operate. So it's the more inclusive term than management. So if you like, management is about action, governance is about how to do that action. It's about the politics. It's about the responsibility and power sharing and setting the policy agenda and objectives. So if you have a hierarchy, management is the simpler level, policy is in between, and governance is the, is the higher level. The interesting thing about governance is that it's not about government necessarily. Government is part of governance, but you can have governance without government. Um, so you have, you have community-based systems, although, of course, there's some limitations to how much you can do simply managing at the local level. Um, but quite frequently, we're talking about partnerships in governance. So, for example, the dividing lines between public and private sectors have become blurred. Uh, so we talk about public-private partnerships. Much of the, uh, the conservation literature or conservation discussion currently, as, as I heard at the last World Conservation Congress, which took, part in, which took place in, uh, in, in Hawaii last September, talks about how to put together these different kinds of, of governance, public, private, local, community, uh, and, and to what extent, what works where. So this is a, it's a fairly major area of, 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 of interaction. Okay, so I get into this notion of collaborative approaches. Uh, few things happening here. One is that, okay, you start with this essential unpredictability of complex systems. Almost by definition, complex systems are, are difficult to predict because very small shifts, you know, this, this butterfly effect idea that that's some of you wouldn't know, uh, very small shifts can, can mean big changes somewhere else in the system or in the system as a whole. Uh, therefore, this expert knows best kind of conventional science doesn't work. And I, I quote a paper from Don Ludwig in Ecosystems a few years ago. Um, so you, you need this, this, this partnership as a way of spreading the risk of decision making. But secondly, you need <coughs> partnership because of the multi-level nature of decision making. So you need that, those decisions at the local level as, as well as at higher levels. Uh, you, you can't have global governments, um, say, <coughs> such a bad example, you know, and we're in the middle of it and I see no way out. But let's say in the, in the case of the ozone hole, you, you, you needed an international agreement, but you had to coordinate it at the national level. If you can't coordinate uh, the, the, the control of ozone destroying substances at the national level, then you're lost at the international level. So, so this is the, the, the nature of that, that partnership, the, necessary, the necessity of the partnership. So, you need collaborative approaches, you need cooperative approaches, uh, and there are many different kinds, but I'm going to mention two kinds. Co-management, which is the sharing of power and responsibility, often, but not necessarily always, between the government and local resource users. And then this, to me, very interesting notion of knowledge for 
action, which uh, Derek Arnold, which and colleagues define as the collaborative process of bringing a plurality of knowledge, plurality of knowledge sources and types together to address a particular pro problem. So first, some code management. Uh, this is an example from the coastal uh, uh, fisheries of, of Chile, uh, coal management of beta invertebrates, in, in particular a species called the Chilean abalone, which uh, gastropod ecologists really object to because it's not an abalone, it's a gastropod that's being marketed as abalone because abalone is a high value species. Anyway, the, uh, the, the point of the graph uh, is that uh, my Chilean colleague in co management, Andres Marin, uh, interviewed, these are fishing cooperatives from one region, and these are fishing cooperatives from another region. Um, this is the confederation of the cooperatives. And then there's a bunch of government departments. Um, there's a bunch of uh, financial institutions, a bunch of regulatory agencies, um, miscellaneous players like media, NGOs, um, and you have the markets. And you have the, the universities and consultants that produce the biological data for the management of the fishery. Now, before Andres Marin did this work, uh, the Chilean coastal benthic coal management was described as a three-part system. You got the fishing cooperatives, you got the government, and then you got the experts who produce the annual <coughs> allowable quota estimates. Uh, what Andres did was this is a, a social network analysis. Uh, so you go to, let's say, one co-op, and you say, whom do you interact with? Whom do you talk to? And then you draw all these, all these lines. It's painstaking work, but it produces very interesting results. Because what Andres showed is that it's not a three-party co-management. It's a co-management that involves seven clusters of players. So that's a lot of interaction, that's a lot of cooperation, and that's the nature of, uh, well, of cooperative management, even in a fairly simple system like a, like a, uh, a, a, a benthic co-managed fishery. That's what it looks like, small fiberglass balls, setting up to sea, usually shallow water, just outboard engine. You can see it's small, smallish outboard engine. A um, little bit more abstract, but also applied. Uh, this is a case from uh, uh, the Swedish Biosphere Reserve, um, south of south of Stockholm. It's a, it's a reserve which is on a, on a delta, so there's a fresh water and a salt water component. And uh, it's an area where you find a lot of conservation organizations, so each symbol is one organization. Um, there are a number of organizations concerned with water quality because of agricultural water use, domestic water use, and then a number of organizations that look at cultural heritage. Now, these are clusters that interact, but how do you get them all working together for ecosystem management? Well, what you need is, a, is a, what they call a bridging organization, uh, which is, uh, it, it's, a, it's a small group called the Eco Museum, which is like a sort of a reception, well, more than a reception center, reception center with brains, if you like. Uh, and what they're able to do is they're able to pull in some of the players here, and some of the players here, some of the players here, under a common cause, not for bird conservation, but to manage the biosphere reserve ecosystem as a whole. And, and it, it actually works. Uh, this is paper by Carol Son and others in, in the Colorado Society. But there's been quite a few studies that, that actually follow up on, on just what happens with this kind of, of, uh, of cooperation 
for environmental management and the kinds of cooperation involved and the variables in whether that conservation works or not. Turning to the co-production of knowledge, this, uh, there, there are a number of different definitions of co-production. Uh, there are some NSF reports and papers by, by Jason Off, for example, that you may have come across. Uh, it's, a, it's an important idea. Uh, here, I'm dealing with co-production of knowledge in the context of what Ludwig and prior to Don Ludwig scientists have called wicked problems. Now, a wicked problem, for example, climate change, by definition, is a problem that has no definitive formulation, no obvious endpoint, and where problems cannot be separated from issues of values and equity. That's a mouthful. But basically that means you're a problem, this is a problem you can't solved by science alone. Um, you, need, you need something more. Uh, and this, this something more has to involve a new approach, um, which must be created through a process by which researchers and stakeholders together deliberate to, def to define the questions, even the questions, you know, like in climate change, what is the question? Because we don't agree on that, right? Well, 90% we agree, but not 100% or, or anywhere near it. Uh, but also, how do we approach it? In climate change, we spend a lot of time and money looking at, at global models. Huge amount of money was spent on, on GCMs, global circulation models. Now we're looking at adaptation options. So, how we see it has changed. Anyway, I, I don't want to dwell too much on climate change, but the point is this, this deliberation is just like a, a court deliberation. You, you talk until presumably you can reach a consensus of some kind. Now, it also requires uh, place-based models. The people at Harvard who started the uh, the sustainability science movement, um, Bob Cates, Clark and Dixon, these are some of the uh, classical papers. They, they started talking about multiple epistemologies, you know, different ways of, of, of reaching knowledge. And under, as part of Millennium Assessment, actually we did work on, on, uh, on different kinds of knowledge systems. And we characterize them as, as bridging scales. In the current terminology, Maria Taylor and colleagues in Ambio have called it the multiple evidence-based approach. The multiple evidence-based approach takes local knowledge, indigenous knowledge, science, transdisciplinary knowledge, technical know-how, and it, it brings them together, not necessarily making them join up, but rather bring them together as a way to bridge knowledge, enrich knowledge, and co-produce knowledge. Now, I, I'm, now I'm running out of time. Yeah. So we, we did a bit of that with climate change earlier, where we characterized traditional knowledge and, and to see how it may be used together with different kinds of knowledge, like weather station knowledge, satellite knowledge, and so on. Uh, but the really, uh, and this is where we did it, uh, Sachs Harbor, Northwest Territories. This is, this is mid-July in the Canadian Arctic. Uh, but the really mind-bending finding is, is this paper by Southern and colleagues in Nature Climate Change, where they, they actually took local observations of climate change, each dot being one. Uh, this particular figure, looks at changes in the biological components of the environment, uh, plant distributions, uh, so on, animals, corals. I, I'm quite sure there's some, some observations of, on, uh, on lizard distributions as well. But the, the point is, now we have so many of these 
local observations, this is not science, you could call it citizen science if you like, but we have so many of these observations, they actually give us global coverage, which is mind blowing. Wow, it's amazing. So, uh, let's just conclude with a few obvious points. Uh, how do I see ecology in the Anthropocene? Well, I see it as multi-level, first of all, like micro to macro. It's interdisciplinary, socially engaged, and it has to include the human dimension because there are no pure ecosystems. Maybe I'm part of it, but even that's debatable. Uh, and a lot of attention to system resilience, which I think is key because that's the biggest ecology tool we have for change, system change. We have to look at adaptive governance at the local level. Uh, we have to look at communication, participation, social learning, co-management as local empowerment, and participatory research, learning together, leading to co-production of knowledge. Now, there's a postscript here because the conference organizers, as you know, ask the speakers a question, which <laughs> the two, two previous speakers address in very different ways, and mine is a third in a different way. Uh, the question was, in light of the state of the world, what's your experience with science and policy? Uh, coming from Canada, I'm a bit reluctant to comment on some of the, the politics. Uh, so I'm going to respond with a quotation from Bruno Latour, who's a, who's a French uh, philosopher of science. And he says, one of the key challenges of the current century is not how to separate science, politics, and social issues which sometimes we try to do, but rather Latour says it's how to cultivate productive relationships between science and democracy. So, uh, in response to the organizers, I see a responsibility to cultivate relationships between scholars, decision makers, and the public. And this goal requires a long-term vision which is difficult to get in, in certain kinds of politics. Uh, but this long-term vision has to be informed by science, as well as these other interdisciplinary things. And today's decisions shape the future, whether we like it or not. So it's not something that can be deferred. I end with a classic cartoon that is not very recent, and, and I'm sure many of you have seen it. Um, but to me, it really captures the issue. So there's a meeting like this one, uh, with the poor speaker talking about all these amazing things like livable cities and, and habitat and stuff. And audience member says, what if it's a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? Thank you.
the uptake of social ecological systems. In, in, in terms of scholarship, huge uptake. If you, if you Google it, um, you, you find that people are more and more talking about social ecological systems as, as linked systems rather than just pure ecosystems. Uh, in terms of management and policy, well, the scholars are always ahead of management and policy, so it's going to take a while. Uh, but the, the one area where I, I see a lot of uptake is, is in conservation, conservation science, which we were talking about earlier uh, yesterday, some of the organizers. Um, it's, it's, it's really happening in, in a fairly major way, I think, in conservation science that, that, that we really have to look at the people as well as what we're trying to conserve, the, the link system. Uh, the second part of your question was ways to promote its, its ways application. To promote its application. I don't know. As a scholar, I'm trying to do the best I can. <laughs> uh, it's a, it's not quite as as long as your 50-year project, but you know, mine on, on Commons is about a 30-year project, and uh, yeah, we still have a long way to go to promote. Better management, but yeah, I mean, sustainable designs. Yes, um, looking at global systems. Yeah, um, the current IPDS as a as a way of the current IPDS is like the, the, the IPCC for climate change. IPDS is for biodiversity, and that's. That, that's going to require, it's an international effort. Uh, there are Americans involved. I'm not sure there American policymakers are involved in it to any extent, to any large extent, but that's going to be important. Because what American policies and American scholars do have a huge impact worldwide. management purists, it's very difficult to do real good adaptive management. Like if you talk to Carl Walters, who is one of the big names, um, he says there may be a handful of, of successful applications, but I'm, I'm not a purist and uh, I, I see any, any kind of management where you have a feedback loop for learning, I think that's a good thing. And a lot of managers do that. Parks people do it by design. Uh, ecotourism people do it. Um, forest management people do it. Coastal management people are a little bit confused because there's so much changing too fast. But yeah, any management that involves feedback learning is part of the solution. Um, but, but remember, I made the point that we have to go beyond adaptive management into adaptive governance. Multi-sector, interdisciplinary. I think that's the direction to go. But even if adaptive management itself is having trouble being successfully applied on the ground, there's the potential for moving on several more scales. I know. Uh, yeah, well, but what's the alternative? So we do the best we can. I think. That's, that's the main objective, not, not to be too, too correct about it, not to be purist, but model of all, and try to do a better job, because the current trends are not, not very good.
Yeah, very true. Thank, thanks, Robert. The, the question, the comment is about the key role of institutions in any kind of governance, of course. Uh, I didn't have time to get into that, but of course, as a commons person, I, I do look at institutions. And, uh, and again, that's at the mul multiple levels. So we have citizens groups, we have local groups, we have NGOs. Uh, government institutions are important, but if they're undercut by government policy, uh, that obviously doesn't, doesn't help the overall situation. International organizations, I think, have been doing a good job, but, uh, but I've been to a few of these international meetings. You know, the thing that strikes me is that they're very boring. Like IPCC, IPBS kind of meetings. You, you have a room full of interesting people and the interaction is so uh, boring, say, compared to scientific meetings that it's, it's actually difficult to, to handle. Some of you know what I mean if you're new to some of these. But yeah, I mean, we have to work at various levels and institutions are very important. Exactly. Given your, your vast experience, I wonder if you could just comment on your perception of the integration of, of science and management and knowledge in the context of natural resource management. Well, you know, responsible science, engaged science. Um, scientists are almost always way ahead of managers. They're way ahead of policymakers, but they can't communicate well enough to, to get that new science into the policy. That's, that's what JSONOF is about. That's what NSF tries to do in the US. Um, it's, it's a battle. So better communication, yeah, socially made science. I, I think scientists have a responsibility to, to just be able to get these, get these messages across.